Overtime. This is Coach Shelby with Coach for Christ, and we have another caution word for you this morning. Uh, if you don't want to know the truth, then you need to shut this thing off. If you do want to know the truth, dig in, delve in, put your spurs on, cowboy, giddy up, and let's ride. Praise God. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. Again, this is Coach Shelby, and uh, I love to bring the word early. I love to bring the word on Sunday morning. I love to bring it Saturday morning, Friday morning, Thursday, Wednesday, Tuesday, Monday. I love to bring it in the morning. I'm a morning person. Uh, David said, early will I seek you. Uh, I don't function real well at 9 or 10 o'clock at night uh, unless I have to, unless it's during football season. Um, my morning comes early. I have the blessing of the Lord of uh, many times waking up 1 o'clock, 2 o'clock, 3 o'clock, and I feel guilty if I got up at 4. Uh, that's just the blessing God has given me. I was born that way. I've never woken up to an alarm clock, uh, so I'm going to believe that that's the blessing of God so that uh, he can share his word with me. Uh, so that I get to make that choice to spend with him, yet it's the drawing of the Holy Spirit. Most of the dreams and visions I have are about 2 a.m., 3 a.m. occasionally. Occasionally, I might doze off closer to 4 and have a vision, but uh, I'm usually feet on the floor and running full speed. Uh, like I say, spurs on and riding by 4 a.m. So uh, praise God. Um, and I, and it's it would be nice to to be able to say, boy, never get up till 4 a.m. But uh, those are those are special occasions. So <laughs> praise the Lord and hallelujah. Hey, listen, man, I am Christ and Christ is God's first Colossians 3 and 23. What I want to talk to you about today is if you're a believer or not. And uh, let me put my glasses on so I can see my notes and and share with you guys. There's a great deception um, today. And the greatest deception is in a nation that calls themselves Christian. And in this nation of the United States of America that calls itself Christian, I want to caution you something, and I want to preface this um, by, by alluding to something. As a good father, you would not allow your children to do what they want. If you had your daughter dressed like a prostitute, you wouldn't let her walk out the door. Uh, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't allow that. You wouldn't allow uh, your son or daughter just to spend the night at anyone's house. You wouldn't allow that. A good father pays attention. He's into your business, if you will. He knows what's being texted. He knows the social media sites. He knows what his children are doing. God is not a neglectful, bad father. He's not an absentee father who's sitting on the couch having a cold beer watching a football game. He is a father who's involved in his children's lives. So when someone says they're born again and they're continually able to compromise the word of God, there is no conviction, there is no correction, there's no redirection then this person is a false convert according to the word of God. To be a man of God means that you will be demonstrating the fruit of God will be coming out of you according to Matthew 7, as you've heard me say a billion times, and I'll say a billion more till I go see Jesus. That there will be fruit, there will be evidence. Jesus said, follow me, indicating that you're moving from point A to point B to point B, yet you never arrive until this dirt suit goes in the ground. You're following Jesus. You're obedient to the word of God. You are led by the Holy Spirit. And far too many people are saying a prayer out of their mouth, and then they're defining the terms of the, the it's like they're in a court case uh, arguing what the terms of the agreement should say, and as if God is going to tolerate that and put up with that. That's not the situation here. So I am Christ, and Christ is God's. And I'm going to ask you a question, are you God's? You know, I get the opportunity to go to many places, and I sometimes I feel like I'm being critical. I, I don't want to be critical. But, but the men that call themselves men of God, that's a, it's garbage, according to the word of God. That's not, if a person would turn that back, and I've kind of just chalked it up this way, and they're going to say, Coach Shelby, you're just a, uh, you're a heretic, you're, you're religious, you're radical, you're this, you're this, you're this. And I'm going to say, glad you noticed. Because my heart is for people, because I don't get paid to do what I'm doing. I do this. My heart is that someone may receive the same free gift that I've received. But if you receive it, there needs to be some talking about it. There needs to be some discipleship. There needs to be an understanding of this discomfort as this tornado is in the background, because that's exactly what the spirit of God looks like when he moves into a sinful vessel like mine. He comes and some tornadic activity begins to tear some, some things down, begins to destroy some things. For I said, I am Christ and Christ is God's. And he's not going to allow you to walk out of that house looking like a prostitute. He's not going to allow you to go into the world and do what the world does with no conviction. He is not the friend of compromise. He is the enemy of compromise. Satan is the friend of your compromise. I am Christ and Christ is God's. Your best life now. 
The person who wrote that book is indicating by the title that that book has been written, that they have no understanding of what it means to be a child of God. This is not our best life now. This is not our home. This is boot camp, if you will. There's storms and turbulence. There's birth pangs all around us. You will be persecuted. You will be hated for my name's sake, according to the word of God. And if America is God's, then God's fixing to deal with America. And yet I believe that the beginning has already begun because the first wave of judgment always is that in Romans 1, the Bible says that God will give them up to a reprobate mind, to a carnal mind, a mind that the world is so ignorant of the spirit of God and the things of God, yet they claim they're saved, cannot even see when a man says he's the man of God and he compromises. He compromises in his language. He compromises uh, and refusal to share what he says he has because he does not have, which is faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. He compromises with alcohol. He compromises with time of raising his own children. He compromises in being a man of God in his home, in his community, in his neighborhood, and in the workplace God has placed in debate because the spirit of God is not there. Because if the spirit of God is there, then there's going to be a ruckus that's going to take place. And that ruckus, like tornadic activity, is going to rip out those things that are authored by you. Those things that are even received by you at birth, which is called the sin nature. Let me turn with you as I believe the Holy Spirit is showing me. And I'm going to share with you my prayers this morning. And you're going to have to do some studying because the point of these lessons is to cause you to delve deeper. Not delve deeper into me, but to delve deeper into God. And in verse I'm sorry, Ezekiel chapter 16. I want to read some things to you. Now, this is talking about Jerusalem. Um, it's talking about uh, in verse number three, your birth and your nativity are from the land of Canaan. Your father was an Amorite. Your mother was a Hittite. As for your nativity, on the day you were born, your navel cord was not cut, nor were you washed in water to cleanse you. You were not rubbed with salt or wrapped in swaddling clothes. Your eye, no eye pitied you to do any of these things for you, to have compassion on you. But you were thrown out into the open field when you yourselves were loathed on the day of you, you were born. And when I passed by you, I saw you struggling in your own blood. I said to you, in your own blood, live. Watch this. You see, this is the condition. This is the, 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 the morality, the corruption, the filth, the adulterous life that we have taken on when we were conceived in sin in our mother's womb. And it, he's using, you know, Jerusalem. He, he'll, he'll talk about Samaria. He'll talk about Israel, all these things, but that doesn't really matter here. What matters here is that you're no different. Your condition is no different, but God has called you. He says, live. Yes, I said to you in your blood, live. I made you to thrive like a plant in the field and you grew and matured and you became very beautiful. He said, live. It is God who saw you choking on your own umbilical cord. He saw you wallowing in your own blood. He saw the filth of your wickedness. He saw these things. And it is the spirit of God, a total work of God who said, live. Your repentance and your salvation are a direct work of God. And why did God do these things? Because he needed children. As I spoke to my class last week, no. Because he longed for fellowship, no. All of these things would imply that God was lacking. God is not lacking. So stop saying little comforting terms to make you feel better. Because if you can bring God down to your level, then you can go to another level in your sin instead of repent. Our condition was wicked before God. There's not one righteous. No, not one. Your, your righteousness is as filthy rags as what the Bible says. So why does God save us? It is for his own glory and his great name that he has saved you. For if God had not acted for our own sake, he wouldn't have no reason for our, if he would not have acted on his own sake, for his own goodwill, his own good pleasure, for his name, for his glory, he would have had no reason on our part. Did you just hear what I just said? He had no reason on our part. You see, God is not a man like us. The other side of that coin is, is that you and I, with the wickedness that has been, that we have done towards God, you and I would walk away and never speak to us again. You would let it, you and I would let us go to hell, but God saved us for his name's sake. He sent, he threw out an extension of him, his life. He said, live for his own name's sake. I hope that makes sense. And if you grab the hold, and if you receive, and you stop kicking against the goads, Philippians 1 6 says, He that began a good work in you will complete that work until the day of the Lord Jesus Christ, which is what I want to talk about. That is the conviction, that is the sanctified walk of the true born-again believer. 
The Bible says, Jacob, I have loved, but Esau, I have hated. You can look in Romans 9, 13 and see that clearly. Jacob, I have loved and Esau, I've hated, indicating that God has a hatred towards the man who refuses this generosity. That's probably the wrong word. This saving grace of the Messiah, this power of God. Now I want to, uh, I feel led as I'm sitting here um, to go back to the book of Ezekiel. As I said, you were in your own nakedness. You were morally degenerate. You were headed to hell. By birth, you were headed to hell. I'm not talking about children. I'm talking about grace period. I'm talking about you. You're grown. You're listening here. You understand. And he says in Ezekiel, I turn to chapter 23, I believe here. Let me make sure I'm telling you correct. Yes. And I'm going to read to you about midway down in verse 24. And I will delegate judgment to them, and they shall judge you according to their judgments. I will set my jealousy against you, and they shall deal furiously with you. They shall remove your nose and your ears, and your remnant shall fall by the sword. They shall take your sons and your daughters, and your remnant shall be devoured by fire. They shall also strip you of your clothes and take away your beautiful jewelry. Thus, I will make you cease from your lewdness. Lewdness is unbridled lust. And your harlotry brought from the land of Egypt so that you will not lift up your eyes to them, nor remember Egypt anymore. The Bible says that this is what he would do to them, that he had saved them, but they began to look back on their former lives. The Bible says that any man having put his hand to the plow and looking back is not fit for the kingdom of God. Luke 9, uh, 63, I believe. It's either Luke 9, 63 or 62. You can look that up. But the Bible's clear of what God says. For thus says the Lord God, surely I will deliver you into the hand of those you hate, into the hand of those from whom you alienate yourself or alienated yourself. They will deal hatefully with you, take away all you've worked for and leave you naked and bare. The nakedness of your harlotry shall be uncovered, both your lewdness and your harlotry. You see, the, the sins that you've committed in against God, that I've committed in against God, are going to be dealt with. There's only two kinds of people, the one that are under that strong conviction and under the hand of correction of God, or those who are experiencing none who are not God's. You see, Jacob I have loved, Esau I've hated, and I could speak to you for a second on that if you will, and I... I'm just going to refer to the chapters of Genesis 27 through 32. And you know that Jacob was a deceiver. You know that he went in under the direction of his mother, but nevertheless, he did it. I don't care whose direction you're under, brother and sister, you're responsible for your actions. And he went in and he deceived his father and he stole the birthright of Esau. However, all of this was the will of God, if you will. It all was, and I don't, I'm not going to teach on that. But it, to such a degree that Esau was so troubled that he wanted to kill his brother, so his brother left. He went into uh, into his uncle's territory. He he found his wife there and his wives, if you will, to the point to where God had called him out 20 years later after a vision of Jacob's ladder, the house of God at Bethel, at Luz. He had called him out for 20 years. He worked uh, as a shepherd thinking on the things, working on the things of God. There was a process going on, but he knew he had to go back home. He had to go back to the territory God had called him to, but he was afraid of his brother Esau, who God hated. Now watch this. He goes in, he wrestles with the angel of the Lord, who is a pre-incarnate type of Christ in Genesis 32. He meets Esau, his brother. And when he meets Esau, his brother, he's terrified that his brother's going to kill him. Now, hold on, hold on just for a minute. Your mind's got to be working just a little bit. What about the fact that Jacob, it says that Esau would serve Jacob? What about the fact that it that it says that, that Jacob would be the father of, of many nations, that he was the blessed of God, that he was the, to receive, that he was the first of God? Jacob became Israel, which you and I are grafted in because sons and daughters of God are referred to as Israel, spiritual Israel. Not all that call themselves Israel are Israel, but those who believe. And so you're grafting in and he's facing Esau. I, I want to show you the evidence shows us that Esau's people were very prosperous, strong people to such a degree that Jacob feared Esau. There seemed to be no consequences to his sin of choosing a bowl of stew over his birthright. There seemed to be no consequences of him choosing carnality over walking in the spirit of God. Esau I've hated, Jacob I've loved. Let me 
tell you something. When my son was in school and I coached him on the football team, I was harder on him than I was the other football players. And he asked me many times, he said, dad, how come I have to do this, this, and this? And the other kids don't have to do that. I said, because they're not mine, you're mine. You see the dad, when the daughter walks out and she's not dressed appropriately, she's his. You see, when the son or daughter locked up in the back bedroom and, and the dad knows not what's going on, then basically what he's saying is you're not mine. A good father is involved in the details of the life of his children. Esau wasn't God's. Let me say it again. If you're not struggling, if you call yourself a believer and you call yourself a Christian and you're able to do all manner of th things, you're able to entertain alcohol, you're able to entertain just whatever music plays and you dance at whatever goes on and you just fit in and everybody likes you, you're not God's. Because the God I got has pulled me out. I remember my son throwing a fit before in the store for a piece of candy. He didn't do it the second time because the attention he wanted, he got. He got a good old fashioned butt whooping right there in front of everybody. That was embarrassing to him. Sometimes we need to be embarrassed. You see, it says right here, it says that your nakedness will be exposed. It says this, in Ezekiel 23, take away all you have worked for and leave you naked and bare. The nakedness of your harlotry shall be uncovered, both your lewdness, your unbridled lust, no governor on your life, no discipline in your life to bring your body into subjection of the things of God and your harlotry, which is a type of love for the world, for those who love the world are adulterers against God, says the book of James. So he got the attention he deserved. And I remember I had people say, oh, I can't believe you did that. No, I can't believe that you didn't do that because today your sons and daughters are lost. You see, God is a good father and a good old butt whooping is good news. He said, those who spare the rod spoil the child. There is a discipline to take place early in a child's life that they may grow up to be men and women of God. But there are neglectful fathers who truly, truly say they love, a type of love kind of like love for a pet, but they have not the love of God because the spirit of God is not in them. And if you're a father and you're not, you're not on top of these things, of course, you don't discipline just to discipline. You discipline when it's needed to correct from the flames of hell. And it is a type and a shadow to show us that there are consequences to our decisions. And God, the father, this is a characteristic of God throughout the word of God. Esau, I have hated but Jacob I have loved. Esau was blessed, prosperous, a mighty nation, a powerful nation. Heck, Ishmael was a mighty nation, a powerful people. But Jacob I've loved. Listen, I've seen things. <clears throat> Let me continue on. I don't want to talk about what I've seen here recently. I, I, I feel like sometimes I'm just being critical but then I word, read the word of God and I say, I'm under obligation to speak the truth of God's word, lest those that God has given me will not be saved. It goes on to say many things. And in verse 35 of Ezekiel 23, therefore, thus says the Lord God, because you have forgotten me and cast me behind your back, therefore you shall bear the penalty of your lewdness and your harlotry. You know, <clears throat> judgment on God's children for adultery with the world. There is a judgment on his children for adultery with the world. I was sitting in class and this last week, the school where they were playing uh, bingo and I don't know, you kind of get just a little silly game, whatever during class, just something to do. The kids all knew about it, whatever. And I remember one of the kids said, uh, coach, you're only missing one. <clears throat> Why don't you just act like you got it? Um, they never check them anyway. Just let me take it to the office for you and get your prize. And I said, uh, that's called deception. That's called a lie. And the person said, well, it's just for fun. It's no big deal. I said, I'm not going to burn in hell for anybody's fun. They said, you go to hell for that? I said, I call this deception. The Bible says all liars will have their part in the lake of fire. And I started singing a song, you know, the Noel song. I said, no hell, no hell, no hell. For, you know, anyway, so I went on and on. I'm not going to sing it to you because I would, it really sound bad, but it sounded good. And I had kids laughing and rolling, but the point was made. The point was made, no hell, no compromise. Even in little minute things like that, 
If you can't be trusted with a pencil and a bingo sheet, how can you be trusted with the, the finances and things God wants to give you to bless the world with his word? How can you be trusted with a ministry if you can't even be trusted with the little things God has given you? And listen, I have, man, I have missed it many times, but I'm in a place in my life to where, man, I, I just soon tell the truth and suffer the consequences immediately than lie and suffer the consequences later by God. And I wrote down here that this relationship with God, and I've been talking about a father and his sons and daughters, to forget God is to commit spiritual adultery. The major contributing factor to this named throughout the Old Testament, this latter name throughout the Old Testament, is forgetting and neglecting to read his word and to spend time in his word and to have obedience to his word. This is considered spiritual adultery. Though there may have been physical adultery going on, there definitely was spiritual adultery going on. There was harlotry going on, but you need to understand that those words are interchangeable. And you need to understand that when you compromise and call yourself a man of God and you refuse to raise your family and you refuse to look after your children and you refuse to direct and correct, and when you refuse to encourage and to build them up in the word of God, when you refuse these things, that you're an adulterer in the eyes of God. And he says, therefore, you shall bear the penalty of your lewdness and your harlotry. There is a price. But I want to tell you in the midst of all of this in Jeremiah 29, 11, the old famous scripture, there is hope in the midst of chastening. In Jeremiah 29, 11, the gist of it was this, is that God's thoughts towards me are of peace and not of evil. They're to give me a future and to give me a hope and to hear my prayer. But he hears the prayer of the obedient, the one who desires, the one who, who understands the things that I speak of now. I want you to turn with me, if you would, to the book of Hebrews. I'm going to give you some New Testament with this Old Testament right here. And in Hebrews, where am I at? I'm in Hebrews 6 through 11. Let me just back up about halfway through verse 5, if you will. It says, my son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor be discouraged when you are rebuked by him. For whom the Lord loves, he chastens and scourges every soon son whom he receives. If you endure chastening, God deals with you as sons. For what son is there without a father that does not, does not chasten? But if you're without chastening, of which of all have become partakers, then you are illegitimate and not sons. Furthermore, we have had human fathers who correct us. We paid them respect. Shall we not, not much more readily be subject to the Father of spirits and live? There's that word live again. That's what he said back in Ezekiel. He said live. He saw us choking in our own blood. He saw us wallowing. He saw us with our umbilical cord wrapped around our neck, so to speak, that this death sentence of life, and he walked by. He saw us struggling. No one cared, and God said live. For they indeed for a few days chasing us, chasten us, or chastened us as seemed best to them. But he for our profit, that we may be partakers of his holiness. So the reason why God chastens, the reason why he corrects, is that we may partake of his holiness. Now no chastening seems to be joyful for the present, but painful. Nevertheless, afterward it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. You know, there's a responsibility that you have in it. There are some children that are that are a little bit more hard-headed than others. There's some that you got to whoop and then turn around and whoop again. There's some that you got to keep on and on and on, and there's some that get it early. The first chastening of the Lord is this, that the Lord will rebuke, he will scourge, but all discipline begins with instruction. Remember the problem in Ezekiel with the people, the condition that they were in, the reason why God turned them over to their enemies is because they had forsaken God's word. They didn't spend time in his word. They did not meditate. They did not practice obedience according to the word of God. God has thrown you, and I truly believe if you're listening, he has thrown you this lifeline. And why do I say that? Because the scripture that I've stood on so many times for so many people is that God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance and the knowledge of the Son of God. If you studied that out, I like Hebrew, but the Greek word for all means all. All. That means every single person God predestined 
but they have rejected. There's a predestination, but, but there are people who've rejected that offer. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever should believe in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Now watch this in, in John, and you've heard it before. You've heard me preach this before. In John 3, and I just quoted to you verse 16, I think, he believes in him is not condemned. I just quoted uh, verse 18. But he who does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And I believe believing is a choice. That Satan, the uh, Second Corinthians four four, has blinded the minds four four has blinded the minds the God of this world of those who do not believe. And I asked the Lord one time, what does that mean? And He says, believing is a choice. And even Romans twelve three says that God has given to every man the measure of faith. What is the measure of faith? I believe that measure of faith is to believe upon what Yeshua did at the cross. And this is the condemnation in verse nineteen that the light has come into the world and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. For everyone practicing evil hates the light and does not come to the light lest his deeds should be exposed. But he who does the truth comes to the light that his deeds may be clearly seen that they have been done in God. We don't read that part. God so loved the world that he gave. He has thrown that lifeline, but the world would not grab that lifeline because it would pull them out of darkness into light. If you have grabbed that lifeline, if the Spirit of God has touched you, then you are God's. And when that happens, the chastening of the Lord, the correction of the Lord, the sanctification, the denying self, Luke 9, 23, picking up your cross daily is the evidence of a son of God. And if that's not happening, you're not his, Esau. Esau rejected. He chose a bowl of stew over his birthright. Esau I have hated, but Jacob I have loved. You got to let this get down inside of you, and you've got to see this. It's a wonderful work of God. He saves us for his name's sake. He saves us for his glory, not because he needs us. He does not need you. But he extended you a lifeline because of his goodness and for his name's sake, for his glory. He does not need you. He's not incomplete without you. He is God. He is God. Brothers and sisters, I've done the best I could, and I hope I did a, a adequate job of presenting this to you. I just, I see things. I see things in the Word. I see things that are different, and uh, and I think that, I think that's, uh, as my brother Jay Fields says, that you know, we have different callings in the ministry. We have the same purpose to lead people to repentance. Any message void of repentance in the gospel is a false gospel, even if it speaks truth on the back end. We don't need our dessert uh, before we get our nourishment from our fruits and our, our vegetables and our meat and our protein. To, we have to have that first. And, and it takes teeth to do that. You're no longer on a baby. You're not only no longer nursing babies. I see 30-year Christians still nursing. What a pitiful sight kindergarten Christianity. And I say that with a strong belief that many of those are not even saved. But if they are, that's exactly what it would look like. I see men that hear the word of God every day and yet still can't identify a believer from a baboon. I see men that keep God in a box and as long as we go in there and we bite a biscuit and drink what we call the wine, we're good with God and we live our life the way we want to after that. It's detestable, sickening. I see men that are quick to buy into worldly analogies and sayings and offerings, but have no faith in the truth of God's word. But they'll speak it and they'll say it. But the, con the conduct of those men is contrary to it. And then I see that no discipline comes upon that life. No conviction comes, evidencing that they are of Esau not of Jacob. We are of the line of Jacob, those who have been born again and saved. I see compromise. We went to state championship games on, on Thursday. Didn't get a chance to go back Friday and Saturday. Uh, had other things going on. More important things. Let me say it that way. 
But I see compromise after compromise after compromise. And it's just like sometimes I say, God, will you just please, I don't want to see anymore. But I don't really mean that. What I mean is, Lord, is is this just, is it just hopeless? I see people entertaining friendships with people who hate God, but will entertain for greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. That's what they call being a, a man of faith, a man of God. Brother and sister, if you're not broken, if you're not sifted, if you're not shaken, if your guts are not ripped out on a regular basis, if you don't have tornadic activity blowing the things of the world out of your life, if you're not like an onion being peeled, if you're not being cut up and sliced up by the word of God on a regular basis, you're just not God's. Or you're a brand new baby, you just got saved, and I praise God. But let me tell you, the chastening's coming. The first two years that I repented, the spirit of God was on me every day. You couldn't make me mad. You couldn't do anything. And I had a violent temper before that. And about two years later, I felt the presence of God live. I didn't feel the tangible presence of God anymore. And I began to experience some of the temptations that I had before I repented. And I worked up the courage to ask God. I said, God, what happened to me? What, what, where did you go? And the Lord spoke to me and he said, when your children were babies and you carried them, did you love them more? than you do now that they walk. And I said, no. And he shouted as loud as you could shout in my spirit. He said, walk. It's time for you to walk. I'll never leave you, don't forsake you. It's time for you to live by faith, not by sight and what you feel. For those who live by feelings will be easily deceived by the flesh, Esau. I added, just added Esau to it. He did not say Esau. Those are carnal men. These are touchy-feely men. These are men who have no faith. Faith is a gift of God that is given to me by God in Romans 12, 3. And I exercise that faith by planting that faith in the word of God and watch an explosive growth that can stand in the midst of storms, point the other way and say, peace be still because the storms are coming. Yeshua said, let us cross over to the other side. The storm came as he slept in the, in the stern of the boat, yet God never sleeps or slumbers. And he rose up and he said, where is your faith? Why would God ask such a question if it would never be needed? And why did the storm come? Because the demoniac, the legion of demons was on the other side. A man needed to be set free. And if you're traveling the path of God, there are storms coming. I don't know what they look like in your life. I don't know whether it's sickness in your body. I don't know whether it's persecution or a combination of all the above. They're coming because the path of God is easily seen by the demonic and you will be tested, which is allowed by God, no different than Job when Satan appeared before God. And he said, but you remove your protection from him and he'll curse you to your face. He'll curse your name. And God said, go, but you can't touch his life. The, 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 the issue with this is, is that his, his faith had to be tested, not for the benefit of God. God already knows where you lie, but for your benefit to be strengthened. You see, we've got to be tested in the weight room to build bulk and to build muscle. We got to be pushed. We got to be worked in our speed programs to gain speed, to get from point A to point B quicker and faster. It's no different in the spirit realm. We understand the things of the flesh. If you would take those and apply them to the spirit, you would become a wise man. For the Old Testament is filled with battles and wars that apply to the spiritual side the day that we live in today the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, the finished work of the cross by Yeshua. And I see men that are just not willing. I see men that'll set up all night for, for a football game, but they won't get up 30 minutes early in the morning and get on their knees. They won't get up in the morning and read the word, so they want to work God in. They want a drive through faith, a drive through Christianity. Maybe I'll catch it here. And what happens is many days they don't catch anything. Because it's not on the top, top of the priority list. And because it's not on the top of the priority list, there's no conviction to stand against the things of the world, whether it be during a football game, whether it be in a basketball game, a baseball game, or whether it be in your walk of life, or whether it be with your son and daughter are dressed and what they're dealing with. It's easier just to be neglectful and let it go because there's no conviction. It's easier to deal with these things than to have to deal with the conviction. I'm the knucklehead who dealt with conviction for 20 years before I finally got up and said, God, I'll serve you. 
I put my trust and faith in you. There was no church. There was no building with walls that I went to the altar. None of those things. I went to the altar of God in the spirit when I raised up in my bed and said, Lord God, I'll serve you. My life was radically changed. I became a popular coach who was offered head coaching jobs every year, multiple coaching jobs I never applied for. This, when I became born again, I became like a plague to the coaching world in a lot of ways. But there's a remnant God is calling today. There's a remnant of believers. There's a remnant of coaches that want to do what's right. It's time to stand. And if you want to know where you stand and you want to know where your staff stands, then you go in there and you start speaking the word of God to your staff. And you'll find out because they'll weed themselves out or they'll draw nigh and be born again and saved. It's time to rise up. It's time to stand up. It's time to fight. It's time to rock Kazakumats. It's time to do what's, my goodness, my God. I know I'm about out of time here, but I'm about ready to start preaching. I just got warmed up. This was a fireside chat. The compromise. I don't care if it's bingo or bongo or whatever you're doing. The compromise must stop. Well, I might lose my job. Well, praise God. That means God's just promoted you to another one. Because he said that the harvest is plentiful, but the labors are few. You think he's going to let you set on your blessed assurance if you lost a job because you were serving him? You don't think he's faithful? You don't think that he can send a raven to bring you a meal? I mean, Elijah went 40 days on that meal. You don't think he's able? And then where, how in the world can you believe you're going to a place you've never seen, seen the kingdom of God, to a mansion that you can't fathom? How can you believe this eternal life if you can't practice here and now on a little job or a salary or an income or a bank account? How? Oh, you're being negative. Get saved. Because the ones that are saved are right there saying, praise God, hallelujah, I'm with you, man, God almighty, because you've experienced the same thing I'm talking about. If you're not saved, you're fighting against what I'm speaking. That's a word for somebody. That's a word for somebody, listen to this. If you're not convicted, because I'm going to tell you something, man, I thought this walk was your best life. Now, I thought the man, you do this, say this, eat the bread, drink the wine, you're good with God, you live your best life now, all that, boy, my thoughts got, I thank God I wasn't raised in church and I didn't get jacked up with, with man's theology. I thank God that I went to the school of the burning bush. I thank God that his word was manifested to me, brought to me. I thank God that the first book I ever read was the Bible, indicating I went through school all of those years with a college education, never read a chapter. Back then, you had to carry books. Those of you who don't understand that, I didn't. I had some really high goals for myself. Graduate college without ever reading a chapter. The first book I ever read was the Bible. And I look at that and I say, man, that is rebellious. That is neglectful. That is a lot of things. And probably is. But that might just be the reason why I'm so on fire about the Bible today is because I didn't get distracted by the things of the world even when I was in the world. I didn't buy in. I didn't sip the Kool-Aid. There was always a tugging. There was always a lifeline there as I was wallowing and struggling in my own blood, in my own vomit. As I was living in my sin, there was always a conviction. There was always a, a guilt that something's wrong because there was a presence of light and I didn't understand it. And I said, my God, I don't know you, but I'll serve you. God, I want to get to know you. My life is yours. I don't care what people think about me. And my goodness, be careful what you pray. Because at that moment, my life began to change. And the people, the hundreds that used to be on my friend list, that used to call and talk and check on all that, man, that, de that deceased right then. I became a dead man to those people. And yet I see people getting saved that have followers and 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 I, and I don't know everybody's situation. Please don't understand. Don't misunderstand. I'm talking about you because I ain't talking about nobody. I'm talking about me. And it always makes me wonder when I see the massive followings and and I hear the community saying, "Oh, he is such a great guy." That just tells me you ain't stepped on anybody's toes. Because I'll tell you what, your, your kid may love you in practice if he's yours, but when you rip that tail, he don't like that at that moment. Now he will come back. There you go. That's what a son of God does. See, I don't like chastening at the moment. But I come back and I praise God for doing it because it brings me closer to his holiness. And without holiness, no man will see God. I pray that you listen to this lesson today. 
I pray that you examine yourself according to 2 Corinthians 13, 5. And I hope you, I pray that you work out your salvation, Philippians 2, 12, with fear and trembling. And I pray that uh, you heed the warning of God, the conviction of God, and you don't call it condemnation. Because if you call everything condemnation, then how will God correct you? Because many times we call condemnation that which is conviction because it doesn't feel good to our flesh. And I'm going to tell you, chastening never feels good to our flesh, Esau. And you can go the way of Esau and you can prosper and you can live a good life, but the ending is hell. Or you can go the way of Jacob and you can wrestle with the Lord. And we have that one account in Genesis 32, but I believe there are many accounts. I believe it's a continual process until we go home to see Yeshua. Sometimes he gives us according to Paul, and yet the Holy Spirit, that thorn in our flesh, is a constant reminder that we need God, and I thank God for it. He has given me the message of repentance. He has given me the message to preach repentance, to, to, to preach it, to preach it, and to preach it, because this is the message. This is the message that John the Baptist preached. He ushered in the Lamb of God. He preached repentance. The Lamb of God is coming. And now we preach repentance. The Lion of the tribe of Judah is coming. He's not coming as a slain lamb. As a, he's, he's coming as a resurrected king and the host of heaven will be following him. He's coming to get his bride. He's coming to get his people and we must usher in the presence of God. How do we do that? We preach the gospel and we walk in holiness. We walk in the conviction of the Lord. We walk in obedience and we stop this fake imitation Christianity that has no conviction, no separation from the world. We put an end to this and we challenge those that we call brothers and believers to do the same. And in that process, they'll weed themselves in or they'll draw nigh to the Spirit of God. I'm sorry, they'll weed themselves out or they'll draw nigh to the presence of God. I pray that you got something out of this today. I pray that you share it because it's important. Hey, look, if you're in that place in your faith walk where you're not bold enough to get out there and tell the truth, uh, you will. If you're hungering and thirsting for righteousness, you just need to feed a little more. You can't bench press 200 until you bench press 150. So. Keep, then, then put me out there. Let me let me speak into their lives because they're going to come to you when I speak. Well, what do you think about that guy? And that's going to open the door for you to be able to speak in their lives. So send this out there. That's why we do this. That's why I spend the time on these videos that I spend. God bless you guys. Uh, Merry Christmas. I don't know the next video. I'll probably do one next week, uh, but I got a surprise coming for you the week after that. My brother, Coach Johnson, uh, we're going to do his testimony on here as well. Uh, he's already done that on L4 Media, I believe. A great testimony of Coach Johnson and his family. But we're going to do one on Coach for Christ, too. Um, I'm really looking forward to that. But uh, let's go, guys. Let's go for Jesus Christ. Rock, Kazak, Umats. In the name of Yeshua, be blessed.